Well, good evening, everyone. There are a few people uh, just starting to stroll in, so I just want to take a minute and welcome you while that's happening. I'm Jeff Mewson, Executive Director here at the UICA. Um, first of all, if you don't know about this Penny Stamp Series, I want to just make you aware of this partnership. This is the first presentation in the series in 2012. We had three lectures last year as well, um, but we're very excited. This is a partnership with the University of Michigan School of Art and Design, and our plan is to have at least one lecture each month. Um, you've been seeing some of the slides scrolling. Um, our January, February, and March lectures are set, so please keep an eye on those and please come back. The lectures are free for members. Um, and $5, as you probably know, if you're not a member. So if you're interested in this kind of programming, it makes a lot of sense to become a member um, because it quickly pays for itself. So please do, and thank you for joining us. Um, I'm very happy to welcome Tony Fry here tonight. Um, someone who has, uh, not directly in the last 24 hours, but traveled here from Australia by way of Ann Arbor and several other cities, and then spent two and a half hours driving on the wrong side of the road to be here today in winter weather, so we're lucky. Um, Tony is an award-winning designer, a theorist, an educator, a farmer, and an author, writing on the relationship between design, sustainability, and politics. Tony has taught design and cultural theory in Britain, Hong Kong, Australia, and the US, including acting as a consultant on sustainable design for the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Tony holds a PhD in Cultural Studies and Design from the University of Birmingham. He is currently Professor of Design Futures at Griffith University's Queensland College of Art in Brisbane, Australia. Tony is also contributing editor of the e-journal Design Philosophy Papers, author of nine major books, and director of the Sustainability Consultancy Team DES. Please welcome Tony Fry. Hi. Well, thanks for coming out on for what is me for me uh, a cold night. It might not be too cold for you, but I've just come from around about 85 degrees uh, in the middle of summer, so it feels pretty cold to me. Uh, what I want to do um, is to kind of set the scene before showing you the kind of projects that I work on, uh, and in setting the scene, I'm kind of moving outside of what is a conventional frame of reference of how we understand the world, really. Um, I, I would like to suggest to you that we're on the edge of a very different moment in the time of human existence. We really, um, as a species of Homo sapiens, have been around for 160,000 years. For 150,000 of those years, we were nomadic. For 10,000 years, we've been settled. <coughs> the reason we survived at all was because as the climate changed, as food diminished, we moved. For the last 10,000 years, we've become increasingly fixed in one place. Uh, and we, without realizing it, we've become increasingly vulnerable. So that's the kind of the base of where I'm coming from. The requirement of human beings to be able to adapt to their changing circumstances that goes back to that whole phenomena of moving as the climate changes. Now, the climate changed in the past incredibly dramatically. There were ice ages beyond our comprehension, where the human population got down just to a few thousand people. But through that process, through the process of adaptation to changing circumstances, and through the process of moving as the climate changed, the human population spread throughout the world. So the population of this country, this indigenous population, you know, came in really via Asia, through Alaska, right the way down to 
Panama, and it took around about 40,000 years for that to happen, and the same thing happened around the world. Now, what we've actually done uh, is we've moved outside of the kind of the laws of biology. Uh, over the kind of historical period in the distant past, as people moved, as climate changed, as they settled in a particular place, so they biologically adapted to those circumstances. And that's how what we, in a sense, characterize as racial differences got established. It was simply biological adaptation. But we've created a world within the world. We've made a world inside the world that is moving at an incredibly rapid rate to which we cannot biologically adapt. So we've become dependent upon that world of our own creation, the world that we're in now. You know, just imagine what would happen if suddenly all the power systems in the entire world suddenly closed down. Huge numbers of people would simply perish. So we've become dependent upon the artificial as well as the natural. So the, the point of this kind of observation, the, the, the point about really saying the things that I've said, pointing out why we're coming from this situation, is that we can only survive by design. We can't simply survive biologically. In the world that we've created, in the world of the artificial, we're only going to get to the future by design. But design is incredibly ambiguous. It is delivered all the things that we can cite as our attainments, but equally, it's also brought into existence a huge number of things that are actually putting our future in peril. So design both futures and de futures. Now, what do I mean by design? I don't just mean things. I don't just mean environments. What I mean by design is the act of prefiguration. What that really means is the act that goes ahead of what we do. We create something in our mind and project it in order to make it. So design at this most fundamental level is a feature of what it is to be a human being. It's a part of what we are. It, it transformed what we are. So when I say we have to create a situation um, really where the future arrives by design that is indivisible from what we become. As we, in a sense, design the world, the world designs us. There's this indivisible relation between it and us. So you can see this is a kind of a huge agenda. It's a very different way of thinking about design. Um, and I'm not going to kind of really spend a huge amount of time um, making it more abstract, but I do want to make one thing very clear to you. We're in a set of circumstances uh, which are extremely challenging. That the word and the word unsustainability in no way adequately describes. And let me just kind of characterize those things. But before I do so, what you need to understand is the problem does not have a name. All the things I'm going to tell you are all interconnected. They all add up to be one problem. But we don't have a name for that problem. We don't confront that problem. That problem is not in front of you when you think about the challenges that we face. So where does it come from? 
what, I'm, what am I actually talking about? Well, first of all, I'm talking about a global population on this planet which is still heading towards around about 10 billion people by the end of this century. I'm talking about the proliferation of cities that are already in the order of 30, 40 million people and that are heading towards regional cities of 100 million people. Now, let me just digress there very slightly because what happens in the nature of the geology of this planet, forgetting about any other problems, forgetting about climate change and so on, the larger the number of cities, the more people in them, the denser they are, the greater there is when there's a disaster of the human impacts. Uh, and we're already seeing those problems unfold. The tsunami in Japan was an example of this. So on top of that, on top of the kind of, as it were, the demographic increase of risk is the risk that arrives through extreme weather events that have really kind of really been generated by climate change. And you may or may not feel them particularly here, but where I come from, we really do. There's a, a, the tropical aquatic um, equatorial belt running through really um, Indonesia, through across Asia into equatorial Africa. And if you're on that belt above or below it, you're already getting big impacts. In the last year, we've lost many towns as a result of floods and fires. We swing between drought, dryness and fire and flood. And cyclones on top of that. <clears throat> but there's also, in relation to all of this, the problem of food, the problem of feeding an ever-growing global population. Uh, uh, and that isn't simply a practical problem, it's also an economic problem. Because two years ago, there were food riots in 40 countries around this world, not because there wasn't enough food, but because the people in those countries could not afford that food. And it might not have got an enormous amount of press, but the huge political disruption in the Middle East was in part driven simply by the cost of food. And then, of course, as you're very well aware, there's a, the global reconfiguration of economic relations internationally, the geopolitics of economic change. Uh, and that is really shifting power, not just in terms of the present, but in the future, uh, in very dramatic ways. Again, where I come from, it is now characterized as a Western culture and an Asian economy. Now is being called the Asian century. A huge amount of economic decline uh, is going to occur in the world over the next few decades. The, the vagaries of the moment are still vagaries. So where all this leads um, is to understand uh, that we are moving into a condition of unsettlement. So the first moment of human existence was nomadic. The second moment was settlement. The unfolding moment is unsettlement. And to a degree, I would say that everybody in this audience has some sense of that condition of unsettlement. And it varies in intensity in wherever you are in the world. Uh, and it is going to increase dramatically. In Durban, uh, in December, the IPCC, the body that was responsible for all the negotiations on climate change, revised their K-1 
calculations of risk uh, and indicated that the planet is looking at three and a half to four percent increase centigrade in global warming, which doesn't necessarily mean that so much in a country that still measures temperatures in Fahrenheit, but believe me, four degrees centigrade is a lot that will change this planet dramatically. At the same time, it's confirmed within a century there will be one meter increase in sea level. And that's projected to displace around about 600 million coastal dwellers around the world. All of this is about unsettlement. All of this is the destabilization of place. All of this you've had some tasters of. Katrina, Katrina was a taster. The, the crisis with the BP oil spill in the Gulf was a taster. The tsunami in Japan was a taster. Now, that condition uh, is really going to increase. I don't want to just sound like a prophet of doom, a doomsayer. I'm not, because what I'm going to say is that we have to be able to creatively respond to this. And one of the obstacles to that is our fear of time. We inhabit a condition which has been diagnosed really from the end of the 19th century and reinforced over past decades called chronophobia, the fear of time, living with the illusion of permanence. So <clears throat> all of this, uh, I say to really kind of introduce the kind of projects that I'm going to show you. <clears throat> the first one comes out of a design competition we did three years ago. And it was, again, directly addressing the question of unsettlement in conditions in Australia, where people living inland uh, as a result of drought are becoming internally displaced people. So this is a, a small town, population of four or 5,000 people. What we did was to select this town uh, within this design competition to increase its population to 50,000 people to be able to accommodate internally displaced people. The selection was based on its catchment in a land where there's not very much water, where people are losing their livelihood through not being able to farm as a result of water, where their livelihood has been destroyed by drought, you have to find somewhere to take them where they have a future. So this is how we did it. We chose this particular town, this area, to make that possible. But what we did was that we developed an incredibly sophisticated method that meant we deviated from everybody else in this design competition. Because what we did was to design from the future back to the present. We spent a huge amount of time working out a year by year scenario of potential impacts for 50 years. And then we designed the city to be able to cope with those impacts. So that was a kind of a methodology and, and that's why I'm showing you this particular example, because we now use this methodology all the time. So the lessons that we learned from this design competition was don't do what you're told. What we submitted didn't comply with the rules of the competition at all. It 
caused a huge controversy. There were 14 finalists from nine different countries around the world. And although we didn't do what we, to we were told, we got second place and won quite a lot of money. So not doing what we told was one thing. Designing back from the future was another. And designing places where the future can arrive. The future is not empty. The future is full of all the things that we've thrown into it. And getting to the future is a question of negotiating a pathway through those things. Now this is another entirely different project. Again, I was showing it to you because it, it was a learning exercise. Uh, it was a learning exercise that took us to the next stage. Uh, it was a project by invitation. There were 40 designers were invited to undertake a design workshop in Jelavare, which is in Lapland, northern Sweden, to move the city of Jelavare. A hundred years ago, they built the city on top of an iron ore mine, uh, which is going on developing over many years and dominates the city. You can see it on the horizon there. So that the mine was the absolute economic driver for the growth and development of the city, <clears throat> but equally, it is what now completely and totally threatens the city. It goes two kilometers beneath the ground. You can drive down to the bottom of the, the mine in a bus. It is some of the highest quality iron ore in the world. But what's happened is the old workings of the mine have started to collapse. A huge crater has opened up and the city is falling into the hole. <clears throat> so the city has to move. And there are some tragic losses, some really beautiful old buildings and some pretty horrible modern ones. <laughs> this is a, an attempt failure to move a building. Uh, this is a street in the 1960s. This is the same street now. It's superficially a technical exercise, and that's what these people initially tried to do, but they, re they realized that it was a lot, lot more complex than that. Hence this international design workshop. The lessons were these. First of all, uh, there was the lesson that in order to convince somebody you weren't going to destroy the city, you've got to really create somewhere to go. And that place has got to be more desirable than the place itself. And you've got to be able to deal with that intergenerationally. Basically, young people will, un will entertain that idea. Old people won't. And that establishes the time frame of the move. Unless you're going to do what has occurred in China, where people are moved violently. So, in other words, you don't begin by designing how to move the city. You, you, you begin by designing where you're going to actually take people to. You're designing the new city before you think about how you move the old one. And of course, you can only do that if everybody participates, government, industry, and the people. So you have to make a huge investment in establishing those relations. And as I said, you have to deal with the intergenerational issue. So this project, uh, forgetting about why you had to move the city. This project became 
an incredibly valuable learning exercise on moving cities. And you can see, if you remember what I said a few moments ago about the number of coastal dwellers around the world are gonna to have to move, it is gonna be a huge challenge in the future. Now, the next project is about one of these coastal communities. This is just an hour away from the city in which I work. It's the city of the Gold Coast, south of Brisbane. Like many cities around the world, it was built in a stupid place. It was built on a floodplain. London, New York, plenty of them were really good at doing things like that. It might have been pretty convenient, but it was also pretty dumb. So Brisbane was built on a floodplain. Then they decided to make things worse by creating a huge number of artificial canals. And there's a big riverine system going up into the hills behind it. So over the next century, the one metre rise in sea levels combined by the back pressure from flooding from the riverine system combined with potentially storm surges means that you could have between one and four meters of inundation so we simply worked through this we we modeled this so this is how it looks at the moment these are these artificial canals because people like living by the water so developers go crazy and this is the result but that then looks a little less attractive when you've got a one meter right so all the blue and green means that what you have now is a whole collection of bits of the city that have become stranded that have become islands and then when you get four meters, there's not too much left. So we, we undertook three strategies in terms of redesigning this city. And again, the story here is one of non-compliance. This was about initially the city council creating a national design competition to design a new civic center and we completely ignored those rules and moved the city. And people thought, you're crazy, and they're gonna completely ignore what you've done. Wrong. That's not what happened at all. So, partly, we, we developed concepts to link the islands. Um, but equally, we designed floating suburbs in protected lagoons. And also we created a satellite, small satellite city up in the hills. Central to all of this was the recognition coming from the project in Sweden of just how much new knowledge this exercise demands. So we created the concept of a moving university. So the university was created in this place for this project to develop the knowledge needed to move a city as complex as the Gold Coast. But the idea of the moving university is that then you take that institution, you take that knowledge somewhere else that needs to move and the activity proliferates and what we need to learn far exceeds just this kind of exercise. We basically don't know how to get to the future. We don't know how to do it. We know how to go on doing what we're doing and often we're doing that pretty badly. We don't actually know how to get to the future. We don't know how to create the conditions that will secure the future of humanity. And that's because of what I said. 
because we're chronophobic, because we don't think in time. It's too difficult. And that's why we need new kinds of universities. That's why we need new kinds of knowledge. And that's why we need to be able to think about how to occupy the planet in a different way. We need to become what we're calling ermatic. So we've been nomadic and we've been urban, but what we need to become in many parts of the world, not everywhere, but in many parts of the world, are urban nomads. People who can actually move, not move every week or every month or even every year, but maybe once a decade, months, maybe once every three or four decades. But as circumstances change, so we need to change. So this becomes part of a conversation. Uh, the previous exercise, the design competition for the Gold Coast, again, being completely deviant, we came second prize. I did it with my master's students. They won $18,000 just for the provocation. And then a part of the Asia Pacific Design Triennial, we started to bring other people into the conversation and we created an installation just really as a way of creating an object that people could talk about. So the very idea of moving, the notion of participating in, just moving on objects around to be able to say cities can be conceptualized in a very different kind of way. So conversation was a crucial thing around all of this. And the kind of the conversation about a new kind of university came out of this conversation. So in July uh, last year, we created the beginnings of the discussion of a, a pneumatic university, a university that moves. And uh, we called for expression of interest and we selected 50 people from 12 different countries around the world. And that now exists as a project. Uh, and there's another meeting of these people in Paris in July this year. Uh, and in many ways, the whole exercise is in recognition that currently we're being educated in error. We've been educated to keep things as they are rather than to change. And if you're interested in kind of um, seeing where this is going and what kind of discussion is taking place, make a note of that website at the bottom, www.theodyssey.com all, which is where this event is unfolding. Okay, I've got two final projects to show you. This is the project we're working on at the moment. It's a place um, called Port Headland, uh, Western Australia. You'll see uh, on the big map a little red dot, the name Perth, which is the capital of Western Australia. 24 hours drive north of Perth is Port Hedland. I doubt if anybody in this room has heard of Port Hedland. But Port Hedland is the biggest volume port in the world. There's more material leaving this port than anywhere else. And it's mostly iron ore and it's mostly going to China. <laughs> and it's a very, very tough place. Uh, it's incredibly hot. It's cyclonic. Like there was a cyclone last week, 160 mile, 160 kilometer an hour <coughs> winds. Uh, it is very dry, very dusty. Uh, not much grows there. Uh, and the labor force is 
fly in, fly out. It's got an international airport. The labor force comes from all over. Uh, currently, the population's around 14,000. The city council are talking about building the city between 50 and 400,000 people. Uh, it's a crazy idea. It's a very inhospitable place. It's at the moment kind of like a frontier town. There's a lot of violence, a lot of heavy drinking, a lot of prostitution. It's a tough place. And there's not much there. Now, the project that we're working on is to design the city, to write the brief for the design of this city. So even before it's conceptualized, it's designed to move. Why? Because as soon as the iron ore runs out, the city's going to die. So you design it to move from the beginning. But again, the challenge isn't the technical one of designing a city that moves. The, the, the challenge is selling the idea to the politicians, to the state government, so they start to understand the issue in an incredibly different way. And that centers on getting them to think in time. And to help with that, we're kind of illustrating the issue by going somewhere else. 2,000 years ago, the city of Petra was carved out of a rock in southern Jordan. And Petra was an infrastructure city. People didn't live there. Bedouin Arabs visited there, replenished materials, buried their dead, conducted their rituals, went on a journey. Two years later, they returned, spent a few weeks there doing the same thing. So we're thinking about making a movie that reconstructs that journey in southern Jordan, but instead of ending up, although it might start from Petra, instead of ending up at Petra, it ends up in Port Hedland, and then we do a journey around Western Australia. And to make all of this clear, one of the methodologies that we've developed is design fictions, simply telling stories. Finally, uh, this is a project I've been working on for the last three years. Timor-Leste is a little nation to the north of Australia. It's an hour's flying from Darwin, the northernmost city. Uh, between 1975 and the year 2000, it was occupied by Indonesia. The Indonesians massacred 10% of the population. The population is still traumatized. They've been independent from the year 2000. But as a result of the violence when independence was declared, the United Nations had to move in, uh, initially supported by Australian troops, there are still Australian troops there. The United Nations are still there. The United Nations has created another kind of economy, an economy of living from the waste. At the same time, it's a magical place. It's a place with an incredibly rich indigenous culture. Uh, what the United Nations did was to kind of open up the country to all the kind of pressures and influences of globalization. So this project isn't about moving the city or moving the nation, it's about moving the culture. Moving the culture back into its past in order to go forward into its future, to recover the value of the indigenous culture, to turn it from simply cultural value into economic value. 
You know, there are people in this nation who are still living by hunting in the jungle. Uh, at the same time, uh, they have extraordinary craft skills. There's an incredibly strong weaving tradition. Uh, there's a wonderful ceramics tradition. There's an incredibly interesting architectural tradition. There's a very interesting wood carving tradition. Uh, <clears throat> and there's also some, some amazing building decoration. And these people make their world basically out of nothing. All the materials from these buildings simply come out of the jungle. They've found materials. Uh, and they are really um, central to their sacred traditions. The, the buildings become, as it were, the repositories of the artifacts of their tradition. And for many years, these artifacts have simply been buried in the jungle, which they were to protect them from the Indonesians. And the Indonesians burnt down huge numbers of these buildings, so they're now rebuilding them. So it's a pretty interesting place. It's a, quite, it's a pretty magical place. Uh, it's a place where people do extraordinary things simply in community activity, where no single person in that community has all the knowledge. The knowledge is dispersed around that community. There are things to learn from these kind of people. It relates back to all the things I've been talking about in terms of new kinds of learning, because much that we need to learn from the future is based upon recovering what we've forgotten from the past. So they make beautiful things. Uh, the, the, the major currency traditionally in this country is buffalo. So the buffalo horn represents a very significant symbolic form. <coughs> um, they make exquisite objects of jewelry beautiful headdresses um, and what we've done is is to spend three years doing field work throughout the country documenting all of their indigenous practices to form the curriculum for an academy of creative arts and that is really uh, supported by the creative community at every possible level throughout the entire country. We launched the, this at an event in July last year, uh, and we had 5,000 people turn up to a concert uh, to celebrate the initiation of this project. Uh, and it was, quite, uh, it was quite a remarkable event. Their musical tradition is again incredibly strong. And uh, so is their indigenous fashion tradition. So these are incredibly creative people. Finally, we've got a huge amount of support from the government and we've managed to get the government to understand they have to think in time. So they have now a commitment to develop this project over the next 30 years. So it's about converting cultural capital to economic capital. It's about a, a disadvantaged people leading, not following. It's about them, in a sense, not just doing something for themselves, but also providing knowledge for us. And it's about the power of vision. That's all. Thank you very much.